Okay. <laughs> so we are starting a um, discussion here about the talk that you gave, Georg. We are all part of Valivania. We are artists and I'm an actress. Anne-Marie as well. Balou is uh, doing percussion. Uh, Martina, you are also an actress. So, but we also all come from different cultural backgrounds. I mean, we have people from the other side of the Atlantic. I'm French, you are German. You're also German, but you spend your time all around the world. And you are from India. So it's a wild mix. And the first thing is we talked about waves. This, you're saying everything is about waves. So, but not only we have waves, we have inner waves. You have your waves, but objects also have their waves. How would you say that they relate together? Like, because we don't always think. This is the thing. Sometimes you and me, we can think, or for a second, we think with more people together, but then we drift apart. And is there a way to explain our Bereitschaft? How do we say in English? Uh, readiness. Readiness. Predisposition. Yeah, mm -hmm. See, it's like it's always fluctuating, so the relationship between people is also fluctuating. You create moments of synchrony, for instance, when you tell a joke. Everybody is laughing. That creates a synchrony in the movement, and that creates a synchrony of the feelings. And that connects you. But of course, then everybody of the group who heard the joke has her or his own trajectory of the waves. So then they might depart from each other. Yeah? I mean, now while I answer to you, I have sort of the image of a soccer game. You know? Being originally from Europe, of course, soccer is a big thing. In Canada, it's hockey. Yeah? But it, it's the same thing. Look, you have the hockey puck yeah? or the uh, soccer ball. Sometimes all people come together, they concentrate, and then they disperse again. Yeah? And then they disperse, all the different players go more or less on their own speed. But when they come together, they have similar speed, have a synchronization towards the puck or the ball. Same with group dynamics. Your fluctuating waves cross. So maybe the moment of we're forcing them to cross when we tell a nice joke and we smile. <laughs> yeah. And then we distance and it goes back and forth. So it has also to do with synergies, no? Like waves goes like that, yeah. but then you've got like people joining together. The, exactly. the waves are also adding each other, right. no? Synergy or resonance, yeah? You can have group effects and then you have an outcome of the group you've never expected, yeah? Or so maybe when uh, people get together and they get an idea or a discussion comes out, yeah? Thank you. I think I can relate that to uh, concerts and music as well. Um, um, I come from a, a classical music background, so um, different bands have got different genres of what they present in music. So oftentimes, as a percussionist, I have to balance away another speed and, um, and, and, and to match the different genres. So I, I totally agree, and, and I think well answered, uh, Dr. George. First of all, I would like to thank Valavinia, Hannah, and Leo. Uh, we are associated for about last seven years, but I feel like it's more than seven years, to be honest. And um, I definitely feel it could be more than 40 years. I don't want to reveal my age, it's, it's beyond that. <laughs> so my questions, maybe I have two, three questions to you, which is in relation to that. Um, I believe there is something beyond brain, nerves, and blood uh, in human relationships or connections. Um, in my culture, they call it as the soul connect or something of that sort. So I have 
two to three questions. I don't know if you have a choice of me passing one after the other or you can answer all the three. So my first question is like, is there anything like a soul connect between people? Um, and I've had many experiences um, to relate to that question. Uh, for example, I'm a percussionist and I teach kids uh, or students the art which I learned and I learned it for 15, 20 years. It took me eight to 10 years to just learn the basic. It's uh, that deep is the art which I was training myself to. Um, and on an average, it takes eight to 10 years for any of the students I teach as well to learn the basic of that art. But oftentimes I come across kids and students or like smaller kids, like four years of age, they come in and then they get it like in a year's time. And I feel that they come with some experience before. And I feel that they are connected to that art even before maybe in their previous life. So my first question to you is, is there a soul that exists in the, uh, in the body beyond the brain that, has, that comes with an experience? So <clears throat> first, when you mentioned the soul connection, that I think it's a description of synergy, resonance, waves, and the waves go through you. I mean, when you take the perspective of the world, the waves go through you. Yeah, like the music waves, they go through your brain and adapts and matches with each other. So I think there's no metaphysics in these kind of experiences. And actually, before answering the second part of that first question, I want to say that you're from a context from India, where you have strong, strong, much stronger feeling for dynamics, for resonance, than in the Anglo-American world. Yeah, um, and that is, has probably in part a philosophical background. You are much more into flow, stream, temple continuities. Yeah, and you see you embed yourself as part of that temple continuity and all your very experience-based culture is strongly based on that. Whereas in the Anglo-American world, as you also probably due to philosophical differences in the background, it's usually to chop up the time. Yeah, you start with here, here, snapshots of time. And then you wonder how you can have an experience of a flow of time. Stream of consciousness, William James, a philosopher, psychologist at the end of 19th century. So now the second part of your question, um, I would say it's a dynamic phenomenon. That kid, that one or two year old, which immediately gets it, has probably a certain tuning, certain dynamic in the brain, which makes it perfectly suit for the music and for the percussion. Yeah. Now the question where that is coming from, I cannot tell you. So there might be a certain genetic disposition, there might be an intergenerational from the family heritage. Yeah. Um, but that, for me, can be explained again in dynamical terms. Yeah? If your parents behave in a certain way, let's say your mother always speaks fast, yeah, very fast, you will probably take that over too. So you might be very much in tune later for faster music. I know that is a little speculative from the scientific world. But what I want to say here is, and that's very important the point I make, when you don't know something, we tend to assume some kind of entity, particularly in the Western world. So Western philosophy is full of these entities. Oh, there's a special soul, there's a spirit, there's a mind. Yeah, but I say, look, you can have a very normal explanation like dynamic waves, resonance. These are basic phenomena in biology and physics described, and they also apply to the mind. Yeah, and what is now metaphysical and you assume specific entities, in 100 years we smile and look back and say, oh God, how stupid were we? Yeah? Remember now when you would assume, oh, the, the earth is flat? You would say, not of you're crazy. Didn't you read Copernicus? Well, of course the earth is just one planet in the universe. It's not the center. Same with Darwin. The human species is not the center of the universe. Yeah, how stupid were you that we think we thought that? Same here, there is no we don't need to assume a specific mind 
to understand this one year, the capacities of this one year old one. And my guess is, it's really basic features. Remember the beautiful quote by Tesla, frequency, vibration, energy. In particular music, I mean, percussion is energy. Yeah, I don't need to tell you that. You know this much better than I do. Thank you, great answer. I have one follow-up question to it. Um, so, scientifically, right, when um, a kid is, before it's born, uh, when a mother is conceiving the child in mm -hmm. her womb, I think they start looking for the heartbeat and start looking for the brain development. So as I see that it's um, developing its heart and brain, um, is it true that while the child is developing its brain in the mother's womb, um, is there a capacity for the kid to learn something while he or she is in the mother's womb? And without the complete development of the brain itself, how fast or what level of capacity that kid can learn while she or he is in the mother's womb? You're asking deep questions, yeah, literally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. After this, I promise I stop and I pass the mic. Ah, but your Indian background, that's where the deep questions come from. <laughs> I know that and I appreciate that. Yeah, so very good question. So you have to see scientifically, after the third month, the baby is complete. It's just growing in quantity. Oh, wow. All the organs are there. And another thing, when you, and this has been shown, uh, when you play during the pregnancy, and I recommend it to pregnant women now, play your favorite music and calm music. Let's say I'm a big fan of Bach, so <laughs> to the appropriate people I recommend Bach. Um, Prelude and Folk is the piano place. And later, when the kid is nervous, you play Bach, the kid will calm down. Yeah? So this is a clear connection. So how you say, oh, this is metaphysics. No. So because I would assume that the basic connection with your environment is temple. So when you now listen to me, hopefully fully attentive, <laughs> yeah, when I make these movements, I'm sure that your brain goes with these movements and based on this, synchronizes with this movement, and based on that, you might decipher the meaning of what I'm saying. So even meaning, semantics, has a temple dimension. We showed that. When you speak slower, you might use more abstract words. When you speak faster, you use more concrete words. That's why philosophers are so slow, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because they're so abstract. Yeah, but that's of course a joke here. Yeah, but meaning there is, um, that's what I would explain. So, and your brain picks up not the tones as such, but the temple envelope of those tones. That's important for your experience. Your brain, for me, it's an intrinsically temporal organ. Yeah? Thank you. Um, you said that your clients, uh, some of your clients thought they're uh, Nefertiti or Stalin. Um, did they synchronize with these personalities? And uh, how did they behave? And what can I learn from that as an actress? Yeah. Very good question, very good question. So first, uh, this, this usually occurs in people who suffer from psychosis or what is called schizophrenia. And what is important, they have really, one can literally, they cannot synchronize. Yeah, they always imprecise. Yeah, so when you do this and I were psychotic, I would sort of delayed answer or slightly inappropriate, you're already moving on and then I answer later to that. Or suddenly also my inner thought is fragmented. So I would stop and have little thought blocks, as it is called. Yeah? And now when, you, and when, when I try to dance, I'm out of, out of tune. I'm sort of completely inappropriate. I'm sort of autistic there on my own because I can't synchronize with the rhythm of the music. Yeah? Because my brain, the, the temple organization is two bits. It's not continuous yeah? it's, and cannot synchronize. 
Um, an earlier psychiatrist, Minkowski, speaks of a loss of vital contact with reality, which I think is a very nice way, because it tells you how important it is when you now do this. I infer from that that you can follow me. Yeah? But that's an interpretation because I can because I synchronize with that and then my brain, aha, maybe apparently she seems to follow me. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. And so it's primarily temple. And these people really uh, believe that they are nofretated. So that's the second part of your question. And it is amazing. They really take on the identity of these people. So Nofretete comes in in Nofretete uh, dresses. And I remember when I was a very young resident, um, one of the first patients I saw, so re really good start, and you will hear the story, it's very funny and tragic at the same time. So I went, they told me, okay, go to that patient, and he was lying in bed and uh, white and has a, had a white uh, uh, skirt and long hair and a beard, looked like Jesus. And I tried, may I speak to you? Polite and because already the atmosphere in the room was, okay, you need to be careful here, something might happen. And may I speak to you? No reply. I would like to interview you, I'm Dr. Nortov, and I would like to speak with you. No reply. I'm getting anxious. Okay, yeah. Can I speak to you? And then suddenly he rose and smashed me down. How can you dare to speak to Jesus, Jesus like that? Yeah, so that means he really was Jesus, subjectively. Yeah, and he dressed like that with a beard and, yeah. So they not only desynchronize from the environment, they also desynchronize from their own self. Yeah? That always goes together. If you have changes in yourself, you have changes in your relationship to the world. Always goes together. Yeah? It's very important. Uh, the brain is basically like a shuttle between the two. It yeah? <laughs> goes back and forth. There's always a balance. Yeah? And usually we balance quite well. Like this. Yeah. But I need to jump in here because I think... Is it that you can't synchronize or that you're synchronizing to something else? You know, because yeah. if we are an actor, uh, mm -hmm. our goal is actually to try to get the pulsation of someone mm -hmm. who doesn't exist. We're actually looking to be Jesus. <laughs> in this, yeah. Or like, not Jesus, but... And in, this is like... This is, I don't know, it's a pulsation that comes from our dreams, our subconscious, or something like that. And it, it, this is actually the contrary to, like you are trying to bring people back into the reality. We are trying to open a new reality. This is like a back and forth movement, I guess. Yeah. Like, practically the opposite. Um, and I don't know, like, psychology is trying to bring people back into the moment, thinking there's something wrong with them, no? Yeah, we try to bring, but before now, I'm speaking, I would like to ask you, yeah, a very good example. So how do you do that as actors? How do you get into a role? Um, and how do you, f do you have in that moment, you really that role, that person, and how do you feel afterwards before? How do you guys do this? Well, I don't know, so I will get to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually had, um, so I work, I work in the field of mental health as well as a, a vulnerability speaker. So I talk about my own mental health uh, challenges with burnout and anxiety and depression. So your conversation around the waves made a lot of sense to me. Um, on the uh, artistic side of my work as an actress, that is another part of the world I'm trying to understand more is the psychology of acting. So as I prepare for a role, I do a lot around and it may be the same, Anne-Marie, like scene development, character development. What are the 
the, the many stories behind. And oftentimes I'm creating my own backstory so that, and sometimes it's like a, a diary or a, a secret journal that I'm writing about that character that I'm making up so that when that, scene, when that scene is being played, I can feel the emotion and I can, I can you know, whether it's feeling a betrayal, whether it's joy or happiness or whether it's, you know, um, feelings of anxiety or whatever the case might be, whatever the situation is. <laughs> and so um, there was a, I can't really, it's in post-production, so I can't really talk about it, but uh, last year when I was fi filming a scene, uh, with the character I was playing with, um, in that moment, I had actually lost sight of who I was and was really deep into that character. The other actress who I was playing with in the scene, when, we, when they said cut, she looked at me and she said, my God, like, I... I you brought me into a place. And I had to actually pull myself away because what I had done was not a great thing. <laughs> and so I had to, I had to realize that it wasn't mm -hmm. me. It was the person I was playing because it was a portrayal of someone mm -hmm. or of something that I would be ashamed mm -hmm. to be or to do. So, the preparation was one thing, but it was also how do I, you know, come out of that character mm -hmm. and bring myself back to self. Question. It's a lot. I know. No, 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 I don't no, no. even know if there was a question. No, 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 no. It's it, it's very interesting because you really went deep into the other character. Yeah. So there's always, I mean, even in our own selves, there's always a continuum of self and non-self. We're never hundred percent self. Yeah, it's always a balance. <clears throat> and I guess the way you describe it, you really went onto the other side of, from the self to the non-self slash the character. So now my question, while you were describing this, and of course, and that can go too far. In psychotic, this, the kind of thing, they go too far. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So that's, they go completely to the other extreme. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So it's always a continuum. That's important. So now my question goes again back to you. I'm sure you share similar experience at certain roles you really like, you really get into it, and other roles, okay, they stay more on the surface. What is the difference? Why do you get into certain roles deeper and others not? Where you see a certain connection to your own self, where you say you could sort of sympathize with that role, whereas with others, you're not as close personally. This is a question. I think sometimes it's fantasy, even uh -huh. having the opportunity to, to, to be someone who you like or maybe that society would deem you as mm -hmm you know, inappropriate or, you know, mm -hmm. not acting or being as, right. at a certain standard. So sometimes there's kind of like that feeling of, I want, I want to go against the grain. Mm -hmm. And in this character, I have the opportunity to do that in a safe way without being judged mm. by, I don't know. <laughs> I'm throwing things out here. Yeah. As a psychoanalyst, I would say, see, living out of your unconscious fantasies. Yeah. That's what they would say. Yeah. But I, I could imagine, I mean, that acting, I could imagine, strongly driven by your unconscious. Yeah. And for me, the unconscious, as I said, is spatial temperament. So from the acting perspective, you know, I have little experience in acting, uh -huh. but I, I, uh, I totally accept. I think it's, it's about the affinity towards the role you want to play and be with mm -hmm. that, and then to come back. Maybe that mm -hmm. counts to how much of that you want to go deep into that. Right. But I could relate that to our real life. Mm -hmm. Because I think if I compare myself, um, I'm probably a multifaceted person. Means like I have a normal mm -hmm. uh, consulting job in software. Uh, that's my daily for five days a, you know, a week. Uh -huh. um, but I go and perform and, and do concerts over the weekend or I have jamming sessions or music sessions towards the evening. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, and I'm a family man during the weekend so um uh, I've I wear multiple faces and I go through multiple characters in myself um mm-hmm. when I wear those different hats. responsibilities and hats mm-hmm. um and I do feel when I finish up a weekend which is more thick with a lot of art and family and friends to get back to work on Monday morning mm-hmm. it's a lot to change myself sure. So what I do oftentimes is Mondays I try to wake up early like 5 o'clock in the morning to make sure that I transform myself to the software consultant I have to be. Yeah. So in that way I can relate mm-hmm. to your question. Um but one thing I would like to state is like the more deeper you go into those roles is when you actually really enjoy it. Yeah. if i if i stay peripheral in in my job like monday morning i wouldn't really enjoy it and i'm not able to be efficient so the the moment i'm in very deep into the job and mm-hmm. i'm able to do things faster and efficient so i believe that whichever role i i play i try to go deep and sincere into that so that i enjoy and if i need to come back and come out with that i would come out in no time yeah very nicely described so i had when you were saying the last things i was saying to you go deeper in the deeper into the deeper layers of the iceberg mm-hmm. yeah because that's where the feeling you, you see how i react that's where the feeling is that's where the experience is not up there it's down there yeah it's a very basic thing yeah i mean this is when you meditate or i'm i'm an avid runner <clears throat> yeah when i run I'm, this is for me like a meditative state yeah um yeah So yeah, so how it is for you that's is acting for you like a meditative state. Oh, uh <laughs> <laughs> sorry for interrupting. <laughs> Cuz I actually had a question about meditation cuz I um is is acting a meditative It is somehow it it's I think sometimes it can be uh, quite therapeutic. Uh therapeutic. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um and uh sometimes living out something can like also help me as a person mm-hmm. but what i uh, also wanted to ask about meditation because uh, a friend of mine sent me uh like two years ago some like meditations with brain waves and uh what i forgot for what the, but they actually were for the us and they were for I'm not even sure for like um unlocking certain mm-hmm. things in your brain like and to see stuff that you uh or maybe getting out of your body and like I don't know I forgot <laughs> totally but like very but like also they're talking about brain waves and mm-hmm. can you say something about that Oh, it's one of my favorite topics these days. <laughs> okay, good question. So, and of course, we have also an Indian here who's an expert in those things. So, um, let me briefly say. So, we investigated in a study <coughs> uh, the brains of proficient meditators, 10, 20 years, versus the brains of beginning meditators. And Usually your brain is sort of organized in regions which process the external input like visual regions or the ex- external output the motor stuff and then regions which are sort of called higher order region more for the internal stuff yourself yeah so it's sort of a dual organization if you want to say so it's a dual topography yeah now that's what you observe in normal people whatever that is <laughs> and that's what you observe also in beginning meditators but in proficient meditators that duality of the organization is no longer there there is no self non self or sensory internal external organization in your brain because these regions are now highly synchronized and they don't make a difference anymore in activity so there's a, a shift from a dual topography organization of the regions to a non-dual organization topography and what exact what do you experience now on the mental level he already knows because he's indian it's non-duality it's a big thing yeah there's no distinction anymore between self and non-self yeah the western people say yourself disappears i would say no it's just reorganized 
And you also more, you have the feeling of unity more with the environment. You have synchrony. Yeah? And because your brain doesn't make a principal difference anymore between internal slash self and external slash environment because now highly synchronized. So your non-dual topography of the brain translates into a non-dual experience or non-dual topography of your mind. Remember? Common currency. For me, one of the most fascinating, you see my face, one of the most fascinating examples, and we develop the same thing now for dreams. For dreams you can make similar when you, for instance, then I stop. Uh, for dreams, remember all these pictures by Salvatore Dali, the clock, these distorted, spatially and temporally distorted the trees, yeah? So how did he do that? Because he was basically sitting, taking a nap, having a little clock here, which here on his lap, and that clock, he has a little uh, iron uh, um, thing down here, and when the clock fell, the iron thing being, and then he woke up and immediately wrote down his dreams. So he basically, oh. never, that's right here, you look it up in Google, you see the photos where Salvador Dali sits and the clock here, it's very funny, yeah? <laughs> yeah, and that's how he came up. So what you have in dreams, you have the same, contents, like a clock, like trees, but they're sort of slightly distorted, especially the clock is shaped like this, the trees are like that, yeah? Why? Because your brain topography space-time changes accordingly. So the same content, like say, for instance, this hall, so tonight maybe I have a dream about this hall, um, yeah, but it may be uh, slightly different because the spatial temporal coordinates of my dr uh, uh, sleeping brain change. So the same content is recalled in a different spatial temporal context. Yeah? And you can literally measure that. And that's your experience. Yeah? So neuronal topography dynamic translate into mental topography. And I think that's also for me, that's when I see art now, like you're talking about the, um, the beautiful poems, I considered it how long are the breaks she makes, because that changes the meaning of the next word. If you have a longer break, the next word gets a much higher significance and meaning, and then you might want to speak a little louder to emphasize that, than when you have a very short break. Right. Yeah? So there's a temple envelope to your meaning. So when I, you were talking, that's why also told him, I just, my temple view. Uh, maybe I'm too narrow-minded, but, <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, um, and I had a, have another question, but I'm not sure if it's uh, from the same topic, but also about remote viewing. Can you say something about that? Or is that not your topic? Okay. Can you give an example? Remote viewing, I'm, I, I heard about it, but I also forgot about it. It's, it's like, I think it's also like this kind of meditation and people finding other people, like seeing stuff from. But it's also I'm not I'm not, sh I'm not sure how to explain you it because I'm out not of body experience. I think it's out of body it's, experience yeah. or something, yeah. and they see what other people see or like, or also like finding. I think I'm not sure if the U.S use that remote viewing to find stuff or something like that? Or they're like th th theories? I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't cut that out. <laughs> but uh, but I'm, I'm very interested in that you too. Can, you can Just a joke. Yeah. Is it to spy someone or? It's also, yeah, it's also used for spying. Yeah. Okay. Camera off. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm joking, of course. <laughs> 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 okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if you yeah. know something about so that. So what I can associate that with out of body experience yes, yes, that you yes. perceive your body from the outside. Yes. And that is indeed has a, has a neuronal basis, a certain networks in the brain you can really see they have lower activity. So what happens here? Again, is an, um, an external input from the environment, internal input from the brain itself. Yeah. And that balance and that external input is usually integrated within the internal input. So when you listen to me, my speech is integrated into your ongoing waves. And then you will perceive my speech through your own waves and how are they modulated by my speech. 
Now, for instance, when your own waves are very strong, you will not, you might process my input, but you will not much perceive it. Yeah, you will basically perceive what you want to do anyway. Like with students, they just pretend to listen and then they think their own <laughs> stuff. Yeah, and when you ask them, okay, <laughs> yeah, same thing here. So it's an internal external balance. Let's say, and if, for instance, in these um, uh, out of body experiences, that is not properly integrated. So you perceive that as if it's outside. So this internal external balance changes in an abnormal way. You might also have heard about the rubber hand illusion. It's another uh, nice thing. Uh, when you uh, put your arm into a, a device and you can't see it, and then they give you some uh, little brush on it, and then at some point you have the feeling it's another person's hand. Yeah? So this internal external integration is so important. Yeah, it's very fascinating, but we have to wrap it up. <laughs> to wrap it up. Since you asked for wrapping up. <laughs> Maybe that everybody, so let's say what you take home from the brain stuff or from the others, and I take home from you guys. One or two sentences. Um, I always ask myself why we do art and why, why I do art, why we do art, why I continue to do that, because it is for me always a very painful experience. And it's with this belief that this can bring something better into the world. And I think it's a new, it's a new angle on my perception and a new way to try to be more aware of the others, to also get this reminder how we, we pulsate together. This is what I take home. Yeah, for me, it's kind of the same to, um, to uh, be more conscious about how we resonate with each other, to, to, um, yeah, to listen more to, uh, the environment and to, um, yeah, create something together, like a kind of togetherness and, yeah. So I would like to start with a quote, which I've learned during my school time. It's from a, a very deep philosopher person named Swami Vivekananda. Um, it always resonated in me. He said, education is a manifestation of perfection already in you means like you're not learning anything new, but you're trying to confirm some things which your brain is understanding. So the key takeaway for me from this conversation and your talk and the whole experience is an affirmation to a lot of things which I could relate to. And one thing which strike me is your example of the, um, the sea surfers watching the waves. That was news to me. But I could relate that to my, either the art or concert. I prepare myself. Um, so just to you know, complete the circle of thought, you said the surfers watch the sea waves um, for some time before they go into the sea to make sure that they understand the rhythm of the, the waves. Similarly, the affirmation and you know, the confirmation I got from these sessions is like, yeah, I mean, I do prepare myself for concerts I do research about the artist I'm going to play with so that I understand what's their ups and do downs and the rhythmic pattern would, which should be matching them, so, and I prepare myself to that. So, so that was interesting to correlate, and, and, and a lot of such examples. So going back to the quote, it's a manifestation of perfection which is already in us. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's lovely. Um, I've, I've taken a lot away and I've made a lot of notes during your your presentation. And I think for me, similar to Baloo, is the is is the idea of the waves and and the the slow waves and the fast waves. And when you first mentioned it, it it, it took me back to the ocean at home where I would often go to the ocean as a grounding place when I'm feeling anxious or just needing to find stability in my brain. 
And so when you had mentioned about the slow thoughts in relation to um, depression and the fast speeding thoughts in relation to anxiety, it, it brought a different perspective to me in terms of some of my own mental health challenges I've had in the past. So that was very, that was very poignant and it was very impactful. So, um, but the ocean will always be my place of peace. And so I get to see it from another perspective and understanding of how those waves can manifest through my thoughts and thinking and, and how I communicate and receive information. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. So, yeah. Not yet. <laughs> yeah, so I don't, yeah. Oh, I don't need it. Uh, <laughs> thank you. So same on my side. So first, I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, um, very much moved by the dialogue that you really listen to the stuff, which is completely science, I don't know, completely out of your domain. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so <laughs> only to the way, yeah, see, that's the only thing we can listen to anyway, so. <laughs> but it's, it's really, so I'm, I'm really moved and very grateful for that. And, and, um, and as you see, I mean, I really use the paintings and also my partner is a composer, so I hear a lot of music and <laughs> at home. Um, I really learn from music and artists. Yeah, and so now t today, I mean, for music, I'm already would have liked to ask more about the percussion and about also the acting because it's a very you brought the psychotic feature. Why aren't you guys not all psychotic? Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> you have yeah, a very dark instance, life. Yeah, <laughs> so it's amazing. That really makes me think. What on earth? Because that also tells me about certain mechanisms. You see, I'm I'm really interested in the brain, as you probably figured. Yeah, <laughs> so I really want to understand this brain mind stuff and. How do you do this that you don't become psychotic? Yeah, so there, there must be certain features in the brain. So this is where I can learn from you. Yeah, from your experience and your mechanisms which you use. Yeah, so the, the dialogue is, is both ways. And I think it's very important. Yeah, it's not just that the neuroscience, you know, oh, we explain here neuroaesthetic and blah, blah, blah. No, it's also the other way because you guys, you don't know the brain. Yeah, so you somehow know it much better than I do. Yeah, so thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Yeah.